My name is Hans Richinger Davis. I'm the Executive Director of Lighthouse Mission Ministries. I've been working in that role for five years, with so 15 years total in homeless ministry, uh, taking people from a place of incredible suffering on the streets to a place where they're flourishing in life. Mm -hmm. And all the steps in between, uh, and really developing those out and creating uh, safe spaces for people, really, to, to begin to get motivated, to be willing to take next steps from their place of the suffering uh, that they're in, and all along the way, uh, those are the interventions that we're offering. That's kind of my wheelhouse that we're looking at. How do we solve, how do we end homelessness in a person's life? Now, homelessness is always a, a symptom of deeper things. And the interventions you want to offer are addressing those deeper things. Just like if you're sick or you, you broke a leg, uh, just giving someone a roof over their head isn't necessarily going to, to solve their deeper traumas and the shame they carry and all this stuff. And so you want to offer interventions that progress people, but are not just dealing with the cosmetic, which is a roof over your head, but dealing with the deep, deeper stuff. And that deeper stuff ranges all over the place, and it's different kind of, kind of mixtures of things for a person, from mental health to to addiction to, um, you know, you lose your kids to CPS and the shame you carry, or or uh, unemployability, or like. All you age out of the foster care system, or you're, mm. you're coming out of prison, you've lost your family and your job, and what do you do? And these kinds of things are all some among many issues that can drive homelessness. And being able to address all that stuff is super complex, and uh, it is a form of rocket science. Yeah. And as you know, people are complex in general, and uh, how to motivate folks that are you know, severely depressed mm -hmm. or uh, have high anxiety or these kinds of things uh, from their circumstances that they've had a hand in or have been done to them. Uh, that's not easy stuff. But the great joy in it truly is when you see someone show up with you know a twig sticking out of their beard and they progress along, right? And, and they, they bring their deep wounds into the light to be healed. They don't need the addiction anymore to, to deal with the pain. And they start making progress and stepping and moving forward and getting a job or becoming marketable or going back to school and feeling proud of themselves that they're a, a contributor, right? Not a not a victim who needs charity to survive, but someone who has something to offer in this life. And you start to see this truly a transformation in a person's heart and in their life. And they start to fight for their life again. They fight to get their families back. And it's always an identity issue, I find, like how someone sees themselves. If they see themselves as the town drunk, they're going to live that out. Yeah. If they see themselves as the scoundrel or the thief or these kinds of things, they're going to live that out. So some of the deep questions we're asking are spiritual questions of people. Like, what? who are you? Right. What does it mean to live in this, this world? What's your calling? And uh, we really dial that in. We don't require any sort of religious activities to participate in our programs, uh, but we make them highly accessible because at the end of the day, that's... That's what's going to change the heart of a person. And they're going to see their true identity, that they're incredibly valuable. And a lot of the work we're doing at the front end here at base camp or with our outreach going out in the streets is pulling people out of dumpsters and treating them like the valuable people they are. Right. So can you tell me more about base camp? So for someone who doesn't know what base camp is, what, what is base camp? Um, <coughs> so... Maybe I could talk through the continuum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of the stages you go through. Yeah. Base camp's a part of it. So, base camp, I should say, the interventions that we offer here, that the mission offers, are three distinct tiers that progress someone from that place of total suffering to a place of life flourishing. The first tier is really our outreach. That's where we're going out with our shower trailer getting people showers, and sense of dignity, you're clean, you can ride the bus and not smell. You can feel better about yourself. Uh, we have our Street Connect vans that go out. They're passing out sandwiches and toiletry kits and things like this, basic stuff. Not things like no propane tanks or, or tents or anything that's gonna keep people stuck in the woods, but certainly much needed things. And uh, we also just started a program called Joyriders, which is uh, the scooter you see over there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going out downtown Bellingham, with a coffee backpack on, it's 
it's got an insulated hose, uh, it's pressurized, it's got a, a cup dispenser and you can pour coffee for people. It's a hospitality for downtown homeless and say, hey, can we pray for you? Would you like to come into base camp? Do you need some socks or band-aids or what, what, what can we do to help you? We'd love to see you come down. We think you're important, really, is the emphasis. And uh, those things are outreach, you're going out to the overpasses, you're going to encampments, things like this, trying to build trust. Yeah. Trying to build friendship. Uh, trying to build that camaraderie such that someone is like, okay, I've got a friend who will walk with me into something I'm not familiar with or I'm scared of. We can go there together. Uh, from that stage, then people go into base camp, which we also consider part of our outreach tier. And base camp is, uh, is, is the hub for anything to do with homelessness. It's really the triage for our community. When someone comes in the door dealing with a serious mental health or a serious addiction or things like this that, are in, that cause them to be in homelessness, you can come there, be safe. You, we've got, we can sleep up to 200 people at night. It's open 24-7. Uh, we have three meals a day. We're doing around 600 to 900 meals a day total uh, each day. Uh, you've got case managers there to work with you. We've got 15 other service providers in the area that come there to access the people there to give them the medical help, the legal help, the veterans help, all the kinds of supports you can imagine. Uh, we test for COVID at the door uh, for folks. We have the 15 minute antigen test that we do for new people coming in. Uh, these sorts of pretty vast services. We've got blockable storage, you got showers, you got laundry, you got anything you need to meet basic needs. It's not the Taj Mahal, but it's nice, it's, it's good, it's healthy, the food's good, actually really good, uh, and it's just a great space to be if you're coming out of crisis and coming out of the woods. It's simple, it's basic, it's the starting place, the base camp as it were, to climb the mountain of recovery to get out of homelessness. From there, people then take the next step, they get motivated, sense of hope, trust, relationship, Staff from our recovery programs are touching base with people here, encouraging them to take the next step up. The next step up is our recovery programs, the second tier. The recovery programs, that is the place where uh, it's a year to year and a half, depending on the person or the family, and it's really where those deep wounds are coming out. Yeah. It's a safe therapeutic space where the skeletons from your past can be brought into the light, and you're supported and loved and cared for, you belong, you have a sense of connection. Connection is the opposite of addiction. When you feel connected, you just don't need that. Right. It creates this kind of bubble, this beautiful bubble, really, of, of, uh, of friendship and trust and connection and community uh, that says we're with you. Let's continue to fight for this life. It's hard work. I mean, I'm so proud of the, the men and women that go through these programs because it is hard facing this stuff in your past. I mean, you've been on this, the road or on the street for 20 years trying not to face that stuff. Yeah. And now here you are willing to do it. And so those, those programs exist in Old Town, Bellingham. Uh, they're down on the corner of F and Holly Street. The main mission building hosts the men's recovery program. We call it The Ascent, right? Base camp, yeah. Ascent. Yeah. Uh, and then we have a third tier I'll talk about in a bit, but the, the and then agape for the, the women and the moms of the kids. Uh, that's, that's where they do their recovery work. And they've got access to 16 classes a quarter. There's lots of case management, chaplains working with people. It's a very robust recovery program. Uh, we're working towards becoming a state certified outpatient recovery program. So people coming out of, out of jail or, or prison have DUIs quashed if they do a state level recovery program. It's, it's all infused with our worldview, which is a biblical worldview. We're a Christian organization. Uh, again, you don't have to profess faith or or participate in religious uh, activities, but 81% of our people prefer it and do. And we want to make that available for people because, again, those questions of identity and calling are so spiritually rooted. From, from those recovery programs, the next tier that we have, we call it the restoration tier. And that's what happens now that you're healed up. Yeah. You've, got, you've done some serious work now on yourself. Uh, what comes next? And, and it's different for different people. Uh, for some folks, it might be, you know what, your, your, your disability is such that you do need some government support. But most people really, they can work. They can go back to school. They have a ton of potential. And so we want to help them realize that. So we are helping people get back into school or uh, go, to, go to college, get their GEDs, all these different types of things. We're also encouraging people to get their own place. But depending on the person, if they need to live in a more of a transitional housing kind of setting, or if they should have uh, good roommates that understand recovery and that kind of thing, um, 
you know, moms are getting their kids back after they've done the work they need to to be safe for CPS to return their kids. Um, we're uh, encouraging people to really become marketable. And this is where the rubber hits the road. Okay, you've done yeah. the work. How are you going to live right. uh, in the world? We call it homesteading, actually. <laughs> how do you build a life, a home for yourself? And, uh, and that's, that's probably the, the tier of our work that we have the most room to grow in. And we have plans in the works to do that. Uh, but that's, that's uh, it's pretty neat stuff to see people getting back into life. And, and having the continued support of the mission, even after they leave our care, where they know they can always come back if they need to talk through something, they have a conflict with an employer or a family member. They know that the mission is truly a place of home and safety where they can come and talk it out with the chaplain and solve problems after they've left our care too. Right. But it's those tears that you need to see a transformed life. And it's my opinion that just having the metric of a roof over your head, mm -hmm. it's a pretty thin metric. There's so much more going on in a person's life. It's an important thing, sure, having a roof. But I mean, all these other things, if you can address that stuff and get someone to a place of what we call housing readiness, they're gonna have a fighting chance. But if you just pull someone off a grocery cart who's dealing with mental health stuff, and you put them in a, in a house and say, all right, you're good to go, uh, it's just a matter of time before they're back in our services. And we really work hard to try and keep that from happening right. so people can continue on in their life transformation and their recovery. Okay. So w you have how many beds again here at Waste Camp? Uh, base camp, we max out at 200 beds. Okay, so um, there you, you'll hear if you go, if you listen to say county council or city council, you'll hear uh, that there's well there's openings and there you know the other camps are, are full. So what what would what's your qualifications for coming? To, what's your rules for being here at base camp? Um, and how does someone get get into base camp? So base camp is a it's considered a low barrier shelter mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's really a 24-hour homeless service center, more than a shelter. Uh, it's more than just three hots and a cot, like I said, all the other things it does. But it, it's, uh, to get into it, you just walk in the door. It's very easy to get in. Mm -hmm. We do the testing for new people that are staying the night. But during the day, anyone can come in and get meals, get their laundry done, all that kind of stuff. Uh, things that'll get you kicked out of base camp will be if you're getting in fights, or if you're repeatedly using on site mm -hmm. uh, and making it unsafe. For anyone else that's there uh, but honestly it is so easy to get in there yeah. so for someone to say that well uh, base camp will let me in mm -hmm. is for a very serious matter right uh, if someone can't get in and, I, and i've heard some of that same dialogue out there like well people can't get in or they don't want to go there mm -hmm. and it is true some people don't want to come into a, a congregate environment uh, i mean and, and i've heard a couple folks talk about well i'm worried they might get covid there because it's congregate uh, but we haven't seen that now in, in weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, and, and we've done a ton of work to make it safe for that sort of thing. Uh, like the testing at the door, yeah. uh, the ventilation has all the, the bipolar uh, filter kind of stuff in there, ionizing filters. And so it's, and we're sanitizing the whole place like three times a day. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a really good environment for that. Uh, we've caught, I think, five folks now at the door that are coming from the encampments that have COVID. And so we send them to the isolation and quarantine facility until they, they, it's out of their system and they can come back in. And that's the hotel, that's or the, the motel, motel, six, motel yeah. sex, yeah. That the, the county uh, operates, but we have our staff there uh, okay. helping run it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it is virtually, you have to work really hard. I'd say there's probably a handful of people in the community that have been consistently had to be trespassed due to their violence, okay. uh, but it's very few. And, and we always, if, if they're wanting to get back in, we will create a pathway back for them. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it requires, you know, a solid safety plan. So, so to, to kind of address the situation of Camp 210 and or the camps that have been swept in other areas, um, they're welcome here. They could come here, and if they're in that, I mean, they're in a group environment in those. Most of them, they sh they should be comfortable here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that you know Camp 210 and then its reiterations of Jerry Fields and Laurel Park here recently. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of those folks, most, like probably 95% of those folks could come in if they wanted to. Uh, they don't necessarily want to. And I should say we know this statistically too, because mm -hmm. we'd actually hit capacity at base camp. 
okay. uh, in November and had to turn a few folks away just because we didn't have the space for any more people. And that's when the encampment started. And when the encampment started, 40 to 60 of our people peeled off to go to the encampment. Okay. Why, you say? Because there's so much great resource here. Well, it's because we, our team, really works hard to be what we call warm demanders. We don't want people to stay stuck where they are. Yeah. We look, we're in relationship, trust relationship. We see where people are at. We know what their potential is. Mm -hmm. And we try to, we, like a good coach would, try to encourage them to continue in their potential. And that's hard for some folks. Yeah. They don't want that. They just want to escape the right. pain of their life, the trauma they've experienced. And so they choose the path of least resistance. So those folks that predominantly were wrestling with addiction issues, that 40 to 60 peeled off and went to the encampment near City Hall because it was kind of like homeless spring break almost. And, and we've heard, don't not been able to verify this, and maybe you can tell me that um, there's been people, maybe the advocates that are running that, who have been, they've given people money and some substances. And so I don't know if that's true. Um, yeah, we, uh, I mean, we've heard the stories. Yeah. Uh, our, our outreach team uh, did go to the, the Jerry Park, or the Jerry uh, Field encampment. And we're talking with our people. We knew about 20 of the 25 people that were in relationship yeah. with the mission on some level. And just casually asking, like, hey, man, why don't you come on back in yeah. uh, to base camp? Like, you know you're welcome there. And, and uh, they said, oh, you know, honestly, they give us all the free weed we want. Like, really? <laughs> yeah. They showed them a, a Rubbermaid tote, like a full-size tote, full to the top of the weed. And it's like, if you are someone who wrestles with addiction mm -hmm. and you hate your life, and you hate that you've lost everything that matters to you, you are gonna go the path of least resistance where you don't have to feel that pain. And you will endure terrible weather, you'll endure assaults in your tent, you'll endure propane tanks exploding dangerously uh, in order to not have to deal with the pain in your life, the emotional pain usually. And so, yeah, first-hand accounts, yeah. not me personally, but my team saying this is what, what's going on. It's like, all right, that's hard to compete with, right. <laughs> you know? Right. Like maybe if we offered hard liquor at base camp for free, we could <laughs> fill them right up. But, but yeah. it's like, that's, is that helping anybody? Absolutely not. That is keeping people stuck uh, in their homelessness and slowly dying, honestly. Yeah. And that part breaks my heart because people have such potential for change. Right. And here they are, by well-intentioned people a lot of times, I know the, the encampments being run by the, the folks that are kind of the protesters, mm -hmm. they are more interested in political change, I think. It's the defund the police folks that, that uh, kind of jumped on this issue, and I believe are using the homeless, honestly, yeah. to, to try and advance their agenda of tearing everything down, you know? Yeah, yeah housing but, uh, for all, and yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that sort of thing, and you know, that's their thing, that's fine. I think some of them actually do have a heart, though, too, and they mm -hmm. want to help, but they have no idea what's truly helpful. And, um, and so they keep, it's, it's, it's a perfect case study what enablement looks like. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a real bummer because all those folks will still stay stuck in the woods, stuck in their addictions, digressing in their mental health. We had a number of serious mental health cases that were making good progress that once they left base camp, totally digressed yeah. uh, there at the encampment. And that was just uh, another sad deal because so many folks just can't help with that sort of thing. So how many homeless do we have in Whatcom County, do you think? So there's two ways to look at it. Uh, the typical count is what's called the point in time count. The, the county does it once a year, usually in January. And they pick one day and they count all the homeless they can, including everyone in our, our base camp and recovery programs. And uh, that number traditionally is around, well, last year was 707 people in Whatcom, all of Whatcom County that were considered homeless on that day. And uh, from there, uh, I, just, I was just, they just did a, a count here recently, but they haven't released the formal numbers. But from what I've been talking with the, the folks doing this, they're saying it looks like about a 20% increase over last year. Uh, the, the, we look at numbers as well, since we're 24 seven all year round. Uh, we engage about 2,500 unique individuals through our programs in a given year. And our estimates are there's about 5,000 total in Whatcom County that experience homelessness either one day out of the year or, or every day out of the year, everything in between. So 
they give you a sense of numbers. That's usually what, what you see. Yeah. So do you find that those come, people come from Whatcom County or from all over? Or is it a majority of Whatcom County residents? The, the point in time count checks that. And 70% typically, if you look at their graph, 70% uh, would be considered local. And local is determined as it had a permanent address in Whatcom County within the last six months. It would be considered local. 30% uh, are from outside of the area. And I would say that, that rings pretty true. I'd say people at the earlier stages of intervention, like base camp, mm -hmm. the numbers are more like 50-50. Okay. 50% uh, locals, 50% non-locals. Those numbers shift during the year. Summertime, people are traveling more, so you'll mm -hmm. see more transient folks yeah. coming through and then leaving. Uh, wintertime, it usually settles down. People are hunkered in for the winter. Okay. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, the, the county council, the city. How, how have they helped or maybe made things worse? Um, uh, see, so you're going to test my relationships with the government. <laughs> <laughs> you can be vague. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that... Uh, or maybe something you'd like to see. Like, what yeah, would yeah. you like to see them do instead of what is maybe... Right now we can see what, what's being done with what's outside of what you guys are doing is not working. What what would you say, what could they do? So homelessness is, is pretty complex, right? How do you solve it? I mean, you can throw all the money at it in the world and it yeah. doesn't seem to solve it. I know Bill Gates has attempted. <laughs> uh, I know other huge money folks have attempted and they give up. They throw all the money at the world, build all sorts of homeless housing, and it doesn't reduce homelessness. And part of that comes from a an idea that's been in play the last 20 years, I'd say, 30 years maybe. Uh, is th we're in the third decade of the 10-year plan to end homelessness mm -hmm. that we see. And a lot of that comes from the idea of uh, housing first as a way to solve it. And part of that is a really good idea. The idea says, well, hey, if you give a stable place for someone to live, then maybe they'll be willing to deal with the underlying issues that they have. And it's good to have a safe place to be. It's hard to deal with your issues if you're, you know, constantly trying to keep your stuff from being stolen mm -hmm. out, you know, in a tent somewhere. And that is true. Uh, but what we see is that human nature, people don't always address their issues, even if they've been given a free place to live. And so how do you create motivation is the deeper question. And so most communities across the country have adopted this plan. It's the silver bullet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Utah, Salt Lake City was the big, big experiment um, that was going to solve it. And you, just, you build, 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 and put people in homelessness in those apartments, and uh, problem solved. No more homeless in the streets. Technically, yes, <laughs> there's no, there's fewer people on the streets. Uh, however, uh, it's more out of sight. It's out of um, sight, out of mind. Yeah. And the reality is, they're still homeless in their head, mm -hmm. and they're not having the flourishing life. And they're still terribly lonely. They're just lonely in a safer space, and that's true. Uh, but even in Salt Lake City, uh, it was heralded as the big response, but they don't have the money to keep funding that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And so that's just all shutting down. It's yeah. not, it's, not, uh, it's un not sustainable. And so our take is that if you can get someone to life transformed, if you can get them to a place of housing readiness, uh, where they can sustain themselves and they have the social networks outside of, of uh, the mission, outside of their apartment, they're healthy and, and thriving, uh, then that has the long-term impact. And that's the long game that we're after. So what can government do to, to support the long game? Because it's easy and it's kind of, it looks sexy to have a bunch of tiny homes, you know, and look, we're doing something, but but it really is a, a, a band-aid if you're not addressing the underlying issues too. And you can have a tiny home village kind of thing and address the underlying issues, that can work. It's well managed, it has the programming, the staff, all that. You can really, it can work, but it's more of a transitional kind of setting. But but this this idea where, where uh, just putting a roof over someone's head, problem solved, it's, it's too thin of a metric. That's not gonna help you define success. You really have to get at the heart. And so, has the government been helping? Absolutely, I would say, especially in our community. I think 
the mission itself has really good relationships with government. And I mean, they helped us get into base camp here. Uh, this is a feat we probably couldn't have pulled off on our own. And it took the whole community coming together during a time of COVID. We couldn't have gotten into the high school without, without those relationships. And the huge efforts, <coughs> excuse me, the, the huge efforts that the city especially put in to allowing that to happen. All the contractual stuff, all the relationships, leveraging them, uh, the amount of work that they put in to help realize that was really a gift and helped way more people while still being sensitive to the reality that we're a Christian organization. Yeah. We have to be able to live out our identity. Mm -hmm. And so working that stuff out and, and writing that line in a way that allows us to have our operations continue how we see fit uh, and not be impacted, that was, uh, that was a lot of hard work that they put in and a lot of resources they put in to help see this happen. And so that, to that end, I'm really pleased with the efforts that they have put in. Yeah. I would say areas to, to grow in and to improve upon is, you know, when folks start these encampments, it becomes really dangerous. People are getting assaulted. Neighbors are getting assaulted. Uh, things are blowing up. Uh, you know, addiction, prostitution, all these things are happening. Um, I know there's a kind of a cultural feel that, well, we need to allow people to, you know, do what they want. It's like, you can't do that when you're in a toxic headspace. You gotta have strong accountability. And so, I probably would have shut that encampment down, <laughs> if I were mayor, mm -hmm. uh, shut that thing down as soon as you can, because you're taking people out of the continuum of the established uh, systems in place to get people their lives back. The longer that you allow that to go on, the longer that, that people move towards death. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it doesn't happen immediately, in some cases it does, but usually it doesn't happen immediately. Uh, but to to continue to enhance environments that are safe, that have a continuum, that offer interventions that are effective, that isn't just letting people, you know, be stuck in their own devices, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So, but overall, I'd say our community's done a pretty good job. Government has done a good job supporting our efforts. Uh, and the efforts of other organizations uh, that are truly effective in right. advancing people out of homelessness. So, um, with I know in the community you have people who donate, and you have um, I, at one point um, when I was right out of high school, I'd done a day um, serving food with you guys, and okay. you had I think it was like Hagen was donating food, yeah, yeah. and so you have a, there's a lot of community that comes around you guys. Is that is that still it's been a while? For, is that still the case? Yeah. Um, that you I mean, you want to talk about that a little? The mission's privately funded. Yeah. So we're totally reliant on the community's support as yeah. a whole. And, uh, and much of the community does support our efforts and what we do. So we work with businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, we get their day-old donuts. Or we get lots of different supports that allows this whole operation to take place. I mean, our capacity is 315 people. And yeah. all of our programs are full. Uh, we can serve that many people at capacity. In the wintertime, more with our overflow shelter. Up to 344 uh, people with overflow shelter. And so, yeah, and it takes a lot. Yeah. To, to make that happen. It takes teams of well-trained staff and strategic partners coming together because uh, it's a lot of work to bring somebody to that flourishing place. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we absolutely operate with the support of the community as a whole. And the government is super supportive of us because they've seen the impact. They right. see what happens when a life is transformed. And they're like, we want more of that. So what can we do that's not going to affect your, your Christian identity? Uh, to support you in this and so uh, yeah they've done all, like just this week we had uh, a bunch of beds given to us that the the county used care act dollars to help support those the beds are locker beds yeah they're locker so beds. They, they they got here yeah got, okay well they're still coming okay we're going to see a semi truck pull up here a little bit every day this week we've had like four or five uh semi trucks showing up okay. uh one at a time so we can get them set up and arranged uh in a phased manner but uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> and like our, our women just slept like babies because mm -hmm. they got the first beds. Uh, they slept like babies, not a peep. They were just in heaven. You know, everyone's coming. Man, they're quiet because you know women are more social generally. <laughs> and yeah. So they're just quiet and enjoying it, and loving it. And so yeah, there's there's supports like that, in kind supports like that, that that allow us to do our jobs better. And volunteer support too. Like you said, you yeah. were a volunteer at one point. Uh, the volunteers are hugely supportive. 
because that frees up the staff to do what they're really good and their expertise. And we've had to reduce that significantly during the time of COVID and, and beef up our staff hours to compensate for that, which actually has increased our budget more than we'd like. <laughs> but, but those are things that, that um, really help keep the lights on when volunteers are helping, uh, helps, yeah, helps the whole system move really smoothly. And one of the more exciting volunteer opportunities are going to be these scooters with the coffee backpacks. Yeah. And we're starting to get that. We have a coffee shop inside Base Camp as well called Cafe Renovare that once the volunteers are back in, that's going to be humming. Yeah, and it becomes also, I should say this too, uh, an asset to the neighborhood as a whole. Because there's often concerns, especially like next door neighbors. Like, oh man, you know, someone's coming by, they're having a, a mental health crisis and scaring my customers away. And that certainly does happen. And, and so how can we be really good neighbors and be an asset yeah. to them as well? And so things like the coffee shop, for example, when we're able to pass out free coffee flyers to the businesses. So if someone comes in, maybe they're scaring customers and they're not sure what to do. Uh, they say, hey, you can get a free triple shot macchiato at Cafe Renovar if you want. You want it? Oh yeah, thanks. And then you go get your free coffee and, and, and you've, you've given a pathway for somebody uh, to get even more connected yeah. and get real help because uh, you know someone who's trying to run their business it's harder for them to to know what to do you know this person is, is, is has negative behavior what do you do so those types of things the getting out on the scooters is really important too with our our team because it becomes an outreach certainly to the people on the street but also to the businesses in the area they can see that and say hey here's a resource and they can ask questions like what do i do you know someone's camping out and i'm not sure what to do here and they're able to help uh, mm -hmm. work with the business owner to, to get that person real help. So, what I'm hearing, community is important. Yeah. Coming around and maybe less government, m more community, or balance. Uh, if you, do you want to grow this to, do you one day want to see everyone, I mean, you want to see everyone not homeless, uh, obviously, yeah. but if, if, we, if you were able to tomorrow stop your fingers, not everybody here, because you could house them, to, to get everyone off the street, is that something that do you see yourself as that's the one the one thing we've got in Whatcom County that is ready or are there other resources I mean it seems like the lack of knowledge of what's around um, people know about you guys but I just don't know if maybe maybe our government programs aren't there's not enough money spent on educating what's out there yeah I would say that uh, there's, there's a lack of knowledge overall in the community and this is broadly speaking, uh, of what's truly effective. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people do you know that uh, had a ch an adult child wrestling with addiction? And they're trying to negotiate, how do I help my child? I love my child. I don't want them to suffer in this, but we're also tearing our family apart, mm -hmm. being in the home. And, and how, do you, how do you negotiate that? Because uh, you want to see them flourish, but they're making these choices. If I show them tough love, if I show them grace, or uh, in between, how, how do you handle that? And in some ways, that's not the case with everyone experiencing homelessness, but more often than not is, uh, especially with the chronic homelessness that's very visible that you see. How do you, how do you negotiate that? Well, that's pretty complex stuff. People go to therapy for years on that, yeah. right? And so, um, how do you educate a whole community on that? I think it can be helpful talking about the issue in this context, like we are here. Uh, I think what I would love to see is a stronger emphasis on what is truly helpful and, and a looking at certain communities that have been effective in addressing this issue. If I could snap my fingers overnight, I would have four of the mission's continuum of care in play. Okay. And you would see zero homelessness because the teams are so effective at getting people in. I mean, there's people out there camping out that don't want to touch anything like they just want to stay out there. They hate themselves. They're, they're a hermit. They hate any kind of relationship because every relationship they burn down. And they hate themselves. So they just want to be out there. And they'll come in every once in a while, like get some supplies, then go back out. And they might have a dog or something. That's their only campaign. And how do you reach those folks that want nothing to do? You could build them the Taj Mahal. They wouldn't move into it. They just want to stay out there because they hate themselves and feel like they deserve the life that they're in. And it takes, again, relationship, trusting relationships, people. And so you're always going to have folks like that. It's kind of rugged individuals, you know, that are just going to do what they're going to do. You're going to have people with severe personality disorders that are antisocial, have, you know, that just cause problems wherever they go. 
how do you reach those folks? I mean, I would say too, there's there's other systems in play like jail or Western State Hospital or, or things like that 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 can help people and keep the whole community safe. But um, is there a shortage here? That means we hear, hear the jail's full. Yeah, jail's full. I mean, there's there's other policy decisions made that yeah. affect this. I mean, yeah. the state's legalizing drugs for people. Uh, you can't deal, but you can use, and you don't get in trouble. That, that totally annihilates the the uh, you know, drug court system that helps people with their addictions. That kind of stuff goes on. Like, oh, crying out loud, Mission's going to be in business forever with that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'd love it if we just didn't have to exist, you know, but, but it's the, the challenge uh, that our communities will continue to face. And, and when you educate folks on the nature of addiction and how to address that sort of thing uh, and how to be effective in the very complex world of mental health, um, I think people are less likely to do the enabling mm -hmm. uh, that can happen, which is, you know, what happened with the tent the encampments that were going on. Yeah. Uh, total enablement. And it's people trying to do their what's right, but mm -hmm. not knowing what's truly helpful. And yeah. kept those folks stuck out there for a long time. So we've we've talked a little bit to some businesses um, around like um, uh, Jerry Fields and n no, there's a lot of concern for safety. Um, there's a lot of concern around there, but no one wants to, to speak out or say anything because they all care about people and they don't want to look like the people who don't care. Yeah. And so I wonder if maybe by working with you guys, you know, if they have someone um, that they can call or or like you said, give them a voucher to go get coffee. Or yeah. so, would you encourage businesses to get more involved with you guys? What are your what's your what's your outreach to businesses? What do you do when they say, "I've got needles all over the place and my windows are broken and yeah. the, the police, you know, there's nothing the police can do." There's no. What, yeah. what do you say to them? So, well, there's a few things there in, that, in those questions. The, yes, we do live in a culture that especially online, it can cancel you pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're a business trying to survive, especially in the era of COVID, uh, especially in the Northwest. Um, it is very important that if you're gonna survive with your business, that you have customers coming in. And if people online start saying you're terrible because you, you know, hashtag homeless hater or something yeah. like this, um, then that's gonna suffer your business. And so people don't wanna speak up and, uh, and voice their concerns as readily. And, you know, I think ideally we live in a community where every voice does matter and you can speak out as needed and you don't get shut down and ideas, uh, your beliefs aren't being, you know, policed or whatever. Uh, but that's kind of the age we're in and so how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, I would say, well, one way to deal with it is to align yourself with the groups that are doing the good work. Uh, create opportunities for your employees to volunteer so when when accusations might fly because you're upset that you found a bunch of needles and you said it online, you can say, well, this is the pathway for health for somebody. This is what we want to encourage. And this, is, this is how we've invested in our community to, to help in this way. Uh, that's that's a, a powerful testimony that will deter a lot of cancel culture kind of stuff. Yeah. I think that's helpful. Uh, I know that we really desire to be good neighbors wherever we are. The mission does. We know that it requires being a good neighbor if we want to keep doing what we're doing. And so we work pretty hard to, to establish good rapport with the neighbors. So we have a, a downtown business liaison that's on staff that we've hired uh, to be engaging all the businesses uh, in the area. Uh, we have cleanup crews that go out. We bring in volunteer groups to clean up the alleys. Uh, these kinds of things that really enhance the downtown area. Uh, and we know that you know people coming in for help, you know, they got behavior challenges and there's different things going on. And, and so we want to make sure that at least the mission of what we can do is going to be a real asset. Now, uh, if we didn't exist, you would have tent campus, which made downtown far more dangerous, far worse. In, in some weird way, that tent encampment was a gift to the mission uh, in the sense that though it took people out and it was a bummer from the time it was in operation, uh, the neighborhood got to see that and say, oh, we don't want that. Right. We want more of this base camp. Uh, this is an incredible asset to our, our community. More base camp. And, and that was uh, a little bit of a silver lining in that whole fiasco. But, um, but yeah, businesses, I think they appreciate it. We, we, have a, we also have a, a, a neighborhood, um, an online neighborhood gathering that we do on a bi-weekly bi basis. 
where different people from the business community or landlords or anything like that can come together. You've got representatives from the police department, from WTA, uh, and, then, and then mission representatives being able to problem solve and work through problems. And I feel like that's a real help because it gives investment from everybody. Like, okay, this is the issue. How do we solve this? Is it possible to solve? Yeah. Um, and, and come up with ideas to resolve things. That's been actually a really beneficial thing for the neighborhood to feel like they have a say. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of a two-part question for COVID. COVID's obviously affected you. I mean, if you could tell me a little about that, about that. but then actually I'll let you go with that first. <laughs> so when COVID hit in March last year, uh, we were like, oh, this is, might be a big deal for a little while. A few weeks maybe until they get it solved. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up, uh, I remember we had a meeting, someone had gotten sick. We are like, oh, those are like the symptoms. And so we sent them to the hospital to see if they were positive. And there was someone that came from our drop-in center, which is the base camp equivalent. And uh, we're like, we don't have anywhere to quarantine this guy who comes back positive. What do we do? And uh, we were thinking about that. The other recovery programs had space we could set aside to quarantine people if they got sick. But we didn't have anything for that. So we had an emergency meeting. Uh, uh, this is on a person who was getting tested, I think on Friday, it came back a few days later. Uh, we're like, we had an emergency meeting with the county and the city on a Sunday, saying, what do we do with this? Well, we figured out a place to put the guy if he did come back positive. He didn't come back positive, but we thought if he did, uh, this is where we could put him. We're like, what do we do if more people get sick? And that's when we figured, we like, we've got to find something. So we started thinking, it's an emergency. Yeah. Where can we go? And uh, the idea of Bellingham High School got floated. We went there the next day on Monday, talked with the superintendent, uh, talked it all out, figured it all out. We're like, we can do this. So by Friday, so five days later, we moved into Bellingham High School. All the contracts were worked out. Everything was settled. We moved an entire massive program. I mean, the mission, again, handles half the homeless population in Walker County. <laughs> and the biggest number of people program that we have moved in under a week. Huge lift, and it worked. We were there for a few months. We thought the pandemic would be over by then. We could move back <laughs> and keep doing what we're doing. And it uh, didn't end. We're like, uh oh, well, the school needs their school building back. Uh, where do we go now? And we had about a month to figure it out. And that's how base camp uh, came to, to fruition. Part of the idea was this was a temporary solution for three uh, to four years max. And uh, so the neighborhood wouldn't be too impacted because uh, there was concerns there, of course. And it got put in there under an emergency permit uh, due to COVID. And, uh, but what we decided was that amount of time gives us the, the ability to actually uh, find a new location that's going to be better, it's going to be able to offer more services and more unique services for some of the trends we're seeing, like seniors, a lot more seniors becoming homeless, uh, families in crisis that just need a few days before they can you know, get into opportunity counsel or other places. Uh, medically fragile folks that need more specialized care. That's our aim is to, to develop something like that. That's okay. uh, gonna be a more robust response that will fill out our continuum actually. And uh, part of the idea too with that is in a, in a new location, uh, we're gonna have business opportunities for people job opportunities to be a part of a, a small business that's operating on site uh, where they can get work experience and, and, and get good at, good at something and then when they move on they've got they can take that with them a good resume with them and uh, those are some of the exciting projects that are coming down the pike uh, that there'll be a, a more public uh, presentation of okay. here in the years to come okay so what challenges do you still face as COVID I, I mean um, it seems like our things have kind of leveled out and calmed a little bit. Things are uh, changing for some people, um, maybe more divided uh, on things than, than we'd like, but um, things are changing. So what are your guys' limitations? What ha has it stopped your, um, or hindered in your ministries? Um, what would you like to get back to? So COVID has put a wrench in lots of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. There's a lot more process involved to getting people in if we got to test them for COVID. Uh, the amount of cleaning that we have to do uh, to keep it tamped down if any brush fires pop up, like we got to deal with that stuff. And um, of COVID, and it just takes more time. 
and less time for, less time for the other kind of work that's right. know, getting people out of homelessness. So that's always a challenge. It's a challenge when you can't have all staff meetings, uh, even if you do it over Zoom. Uh, it's not as, you don't have the eye contact. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just harder to, to relate in the lack of volunteers um, because of COVID. And a lot of our volunteers were older, and so it's a, more of a concern. Uh, it's just like, oh man, we can't do, we can't be as effective as we'd like to be. Have those restrictions been put upon you, or is it just precaution, or maybe people being hesitant? Uh, some of us put upon us, you know, by the governor. I mean, that's where it all began. Yeah. We can sleep people close to each other and things like this. Um, so we moved to the high school and here to base camp. Um, but, uh, and, and the precautions, I mean, thankfully, all our staff have been vaccinated and a good portion of our guests have been vaccinated as well uh, here recently. And so a lot of those concerns are lessening. And so you're feeling a little more free uh, to, to engage and bring the volunteers in. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been a it's been a huge hassle uh, having to deal with COVID and the concerns and and most of it. I mean, we're trying to be proactive too and really um, alleviate a lot of those concerns because, like I mentioned earlier, some some folks didn't want to come into the shelter because they were worried, yeah. and so they're staying stuck and not getting actual services and real help. They're staying out in their tents, and that's the excuse they're using. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, no, no, come in, like. We've got the ventilation dialed in. We've got yeah. everything worked out so you can come in and feel safe. Yeah. And uh, and so, yeah, we had to do all that in order to, to continue yeah. getting people in the door. So um, now we see lockdowns, COVID, the long-term effects, and especially with, uh, with our youth and, and the ones coming out of high school. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, as you're planning for things to come, are you planning for what potentially could be more mental need, um, more drug abuse? Yep. Um, the the opioid pandemic is is nationally it's a thing. growing. Yeah, it's growing. Yes, Absolutely. and the decriminalizing of stuff now. I mean, that's going to make it that much harder to to stop. Yeah, you know, one of the the main things that COVID has done, because uh, in reality, yeah, a lot of people are getting sick. Yeah, some are dying from it, uh, but you know it's basically double what the flu uh, would bring uh, in terms of death in our country. Um, I would say that that um, what's to come. How's this going to impact? A lot of small businesses uh, have suffered mightily. Have had to close doors, lay people off. Uh, when the unemployment ends. There's no more small businesses to go work for because they've all had to shut down, especially people in the service industry, uh, the impacts they've had, uh, the loneliness that comes, which our people that come through our programs know all too well, um, and the level of drug use and alcohol abuse, cannabis use that has skyrocketed uh, over this last year to not feel the pain of the loneliness of being stuck at home. Uh, or having lost your job or the uncertainty of the future. Uh, the, the amount of mental health concerns that have increased that we've seen in youth with suicides and these kinds of things. Um, that All that, the, the, when the eviction moratorium ends, um, who knows how that's gonna be softened, right? And, and landlords gotta pay their, yeah. their, uh, their mortgages too. Uh, these kinds of things, there's gonna be a wave over the next couple of years uh, coming to our doors. I've already seen it with an increase in families experiencing homelessness. Uh, we've seen it in a lot of older folks that their pride won't let them ride on the eviction moratorium. But when the rents go up and their their uh, fixed income can't can't uh, meet it, they're becoming homeless and coming in our doors. I had a business owner downtown call me and says, "You know what? My business is failing because of COVID. Uh, I don't have the community's friends that can take me in. I think I need to stay there." What's the process? Right. This is a downtown business owner. Wow. And so those sorts of things are happening, have been happening, and will uh, continue to happen uh, for the next few years. How do we respond to that? I know the mission is the probably the chief agent in our community addressing homeless, chronic homelessness in terms of the, the immediate response and the immediate need. We're not building low-income housing or, or you know, keeping fathers in the home you know, yeah. in front of, of things or we're dealing with some of the adverse childhood experiences that, that get 
uh, young people into this place where homelessness is going to be a thing for them. Um, but what we can do is continue to offer our robust services that we do and plan for the future to increase that. Like I said, 2,500 people experience homelessness in a year. There's 5,000 in our community that experience. This is numbers we researched here recently. 5,000 in a year. We want to be able to reach the full 5,000 plus some because we know the more coming down the pike. And it's all those tiers of intervention that are necessary to get there. It's the outreach. It's the, which includes base camp types of programs. It's the recovery programs. And it's the restoration programs. They're going to get people back to the flourishing life that, that COVID has, has brought upon us, the culture has brought upon us. All these things that kind of feed, the big, big picture things that feed homelessness. Um, we want to help resolve that. We feel we're well positioned to do that in our community. And uh, we're going to continue fighting for these lives to see them flourish because that's what we're all about. And I think we can all agree as a community, we all care about people. So would you say more community support? More more community coming around and learning and and, yeah. and finding out how they can do anything? It's, it's, a, it's a community problem. It requires a community response. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it requires a smart response. You know, this looking at, at how these things work and what are the... What are the stats on this stuff? And how do you yeah. how do you get these people? What, what sort of metrics should we be using here? And it takes all of that to happen. And, and I would I would agree with you too. It's a unifying thing. Like everyone cares about homelessness. Yeah. No one wants to, to see people suffer like this. The division does come in how how is it effective? The philosophy and how you how you bring people out of homelessness. There is disparity there. But but I would say as a whole, the community wants to see this problem resolved, and they will unify around it. And how great it is it when people from different walks of life, different perspectives, different ends of the political spectrum can come together on this one issue of homelessness mm -hmm. and see it resolved. Mm -hmm. And what would you ask of the community? What would you say to the person who's like, hey, how, what can I do? I would say, get involved. <laughs> Look around. It's not just the mission. There's a lot of other groups doing things too. The mission's certainly probably the biggest one, getting them a lot done. Uh, but look around, see what, see what things really spark something in you. Maybe see what things make you angry, actually. And maybe that's something that uh, is being put upon you to say, yes, I should do something about that. And, and look around. And who should they contact? Contact the mission, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, hop on our website. That's probably the easiest way to do it. TheLighthouseMission.org. Give us a call at 733-5120. Email us. Get a tour. Sit down with me. I roast my own coffee in my office. I've got a whole little setup there. Oh, you can bring it on a scooter. I, yeah, <laughs> bring that's right. I'll bring it on a scooter. Yeah. Come on down. But, but get a feel for it. Yeah. You know, be kind. See the folks, you know, flying the sign. You know, it's a bad idea to give folk, folks money that are flying signs. Uh, but, but man, look them in the eyes. Yeah. Right? Try and figure out their name if you can. Give them a smile. Just a little sense of dignity. I mean, it's, they hate themselves flying signs. You get used to it after a while. It's like prostitution, you know, like yeah. you get you hate it at first and you get used to it or whatever, and then you're in the life and it's and it's uh, a lifetime of, of atrocity and horror. But same thing with flying a sign, you know, you give someone money, they're gonna stay stuck in the woods with that money. But uh, but man, give them dignity, treat them like a human being, and uh, and you'll see yourself change in the process.